We now begin part two of our introductory presentation for the survey of furniture and interiors. The story of the relationship between the fine and decorative arts is a long and complex one. But the point I want to make here with these two images is this. Some of the greatest painters, that is, fine artists of all time, were also interior designers. The proof? What are we looking at here? Two of the most important interiors of the Renaissance, designed and executed by two of the most famous fine artists of all time, Michelangelo and Raphael. Two of the greatest painters of their day, blurring the lines between the fine and decorative arts. So what is the line? What is the difference between these two? Since the Renaissance, the three fine arts, painting, sculpture, and architecture, have been regarded as the most serious, the most exalted art forms. And what are the decorative arts? Basically everything else. Different terms have been used to define them over the last few centuries. The useful arts, crafts, industrial arts, but the main difference between the fine arts and the decorative arts is this. The fine arts we look at, we admire, we contemplate. The decorative arts we use. All the objects that populate interiors fall into this category. Furniture, textiles, glass, ceramics, light fixtures, even paint and wallpaper. But wait a minute, you may say, don't we also use architecture? I'll say more about that in a moment. But one reason architecture is considered a fine art is perhaps this. We appreciate the aesthetics of architecture from the outside. We consider its sculptural qualities, its form, its relationship to the site. Basically, we stand back and look at it. But as different as the fine and decorative arts may seem to be from each other, they are quite closely related in fundamental ways. Are not walls, ceilings, and floors two-dimensional surfaces covered with an ornamental material, just like a painting on canvas? Is a chair not a three-dimensional composition in space to be admired from all angles, like a sculpture? And is a building not also a useful object? It certainly is. Let's take a brief look at this special relationship between architecture and interiors. We've already noted some of the important connections between architecture and interior design. One, that architectural style trickles in. Another is that the structural elements are often expressed on the interior, becoming part of the design, at times even playing a decorative role. Here we see two examples of this and more. For as my note says, the history of architecture is all about creating more effective interior space. Makes sense, right? People, corporations, do not spend thousands, millions of dollars to make a sculpture in a landscape. They spend that kind of money to create interiors, places where people function. And that's exactly what the Romans did on the right. Obliged to create spaces that could accommodate large crowds at one time, they developed the dome. Used here, the Pantheon allowed for over 700 square feet of interior space, unobstructed by supports of any kind. So the entire architectural design concept hinged upon how the interior space was to be used. And the reflection of both the structure and the architectural style, classicism, gave rise to the entire interior aesthetic. Now, while the interior on the left could not be more different, the premise is the same. Architectural structure expressed on the interior creates a particular aesthetic and effect upon the people who enter. Here the structure is so much a part of the interior that there's hardly any interior at all. But is this all about structure? Absolutely not. The Egyptians were very advanced and certainly could have configured a dome, but the meaning they wanted to communicate with this aesthetic would have been lost. To summarize this brief contemplation of the relationship between architecture and interior design, the immortal words of the great Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, the reality of the building consists not in the four walls, but in the space within. 
This whole conversation began with the discussion of the relationship between the fine and decorative arts. And to sum that up, I can't think of a better example than this, Schroeder House, as close as anyone can get to actually living inside of a painting. We'll talk more about how and why this all came about. But speaking of talking, let's look at the close connection that also exists between the vocabulary we use to describe both the fine and decorative arts. You may recognize these two lists from art or art history classes as they are originally the vocabulary of the fine arts, qualities and characteristics we look to when analyzing painting, sculpture, and architecture. But they are also highly effective in describing the decorative arts. You'll certainly be exploring them more in your studio classes, so I won't spend a lot of time on them here. But I encourage you to take some time on your own and see how you would use these terms to describe the characteristics of the following two interiors. Think about not only what these characteristics are, but also of what they are not. Being able to sense and articulate the qualities that a space or an object does not have is as important and useful as accuracy about those it does embody. For this reason, a tool I recommend for analyzing and describing design is thinking in terms of opposites. Here's a list of some common ones, but there are certainly more and you yourself will probably add to the list over the course of your professional life. The two mirrors and the pairs of opposites that describe them illustrate this application. Here's another example. Two chairs and four pairs of opposites that relate to them. Do you recognize how? This pair of chairs illustrates two of my favorite pairs of opposites, literal abstract and superficial essential. I am saying here that the chair on the left is literal and superficial, while the other is more abstract and essential. Why do I say this? Before moving on, do you have any ideas? As you can see, this chair expresses quite literally the style of Gothic architecture. It reads very clearly and obviously as Gothic, and all the symbols are ornamental, decorative, icing on the cake, if you will. This chair is also expressing Gothic architecture, but in a more subtle manner. It has abstracted all down to a form that is the essence of what Gothic architecture is all about. Can you say what that is? Here you go. See it? The structure of the chair was inspired by the tensile skeleton that is the heart and soul of Gothic architecture, shown here in an example of Gothic ribbed vaulting. This chair has ignored the icing and is working with the cake, the essence of gothicness. Nice, isn't it? So a great example of how the exact same source of influence or inspiration can affect and be used and expressed by different designers in different ways due to any number of reasons, not the least of which is simply their innate individuality. But we can and will also see the individuality of an entire culture expressed in design. While today it is exceedingly difficult to identify and classify specific styles and their origins, in previous centuries, as seen in Part 1, the characteristics of a particular new style and the nation of its origin were very clear-cut and well-known. Awareness of and excitement about important new styles traveled between countries and cultures. But before mass media, how did that happen? A few final socio-political economic points related to the shaping of style can shed some light on this. For one, migration, people relocating for various reasons the same as today. We see artists and craftsmen seeking better opportunity in a new land, fleeing religious persecution, or moving as part of a marriage entourage. The bride always relocated to the husband's land and brought her culture with her in the artists and craftsmen that usually accompanied her. 
Style was also carried by warriors who ventured to foreign lands, absorbed that culture, and often returned with exotic new objects or simply a taste for them. In the same vein, trade transported all manner of objects, and therefore style, from one part of the world to another. The Silk Road, a famous network of ancient overland trade routes between China and the West, carried oriental silks to Rome as early as the first century. But perhaps the most important method for the transmission of design before mass media was the ornamental print. We'll look at the important role they played later, but for now this. Once a new style arrived in a country, what happened to it? How was it expressed? Here we see the same style expressed in three different countries, so through three different cultures. In many ways they are the same because they are the same style, but in many ways they are also different because they are expressed through three different cultures. Can you identify those different sets of characteristics? You will be able to. We also look at how the same style within the same country can be expressed differently. And this is important for you to know about. So on this page and the next, I've written detailed definitions of these different levels of style within a culture. And I'll also provide them to you as a handout. High style is extremely important for us. Objects in that category are usually the quintessential examples of a style. So they are the ones we focus on to gain an understanding of the style in its purest form. And because they were so valuable at the time they were made, those are the objects that we have available for study in museums and private collections. But the vernacular, which can be described as the opposite of high style, played an extremely important role in design history. So familiarize yourself with the meaning of that term. Here, using ceramics and interiors, an illustration of those two extremes, vernacular and high style. Images 20 through 28 contain some exercises for you which should clarify the concept of defining characteristics. Specifically, you can give lots of information about what an object looks like, but if the key characteristics are missing, you'll miss the mark. Flip through those and I'll see you at the end. I didn't plan it this way when I picked these examples, but it worked out nicely as things often do. Because this bag and this phone are two of the most influential status symbols of our time. And coincidentally, the emergence of the decorative arts and design, furniture in particular, had everything to do with just that, status. You will see that and much more in our first lecture, Prehistory and Early Civilization. See you in class.